Hi, Santa Cruz Association of Realtors. Jim Black here from the Education Committee. Wanted to share the video, in case you missed it, a few weeks ago of Ken DeLeon and his great presentation on life and business and how to make a balance of it all and learn more about some of the leaders of our industry. Thank you again for attending if you did attend and we look forward to bringing more events to you in the near future. Good morning everyone. I want to thank you for the honor of speaking to you today. Um, even though I'm over the hill, I have a very fond affection for Santa Cruz. I've been here hundreds of times. Um, I'm, I have four amazing children and I've uh, been divorced and my children actually live in the Scotts Valley area, so I spend a lot of time here. Um, but I love it, and it's a true honor to be here. Um, so I can't say, and I already had the privilege of meeting several of you, and I can tell there's a lot of camaraderie and greatness in the room. So it's a true honor to be here. Uh, sorry, it's a little tinny. Um, but I uh, also want to thank you again, and questions anytime. So I thought today, it's an honor to be here. I thought I'd talk about um, two things. One would just be, that's OK. Um, so one would be, you've got to have a great assistant in life. Um, one would be just kind of professional tips. You know, what I did to kind of try to improve myself that might be something of value to you um, to kind of stand apart, to kind of grow your business. Um, but also, I think my greatest strength is in the second half of the presentation, I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the life events that happened to me. And I've been through four pretty intense, um, some people call them tragedies, I call them opportunities to learn from. And actually, it's those events and the life lessons I learned from them that I think have really propelled me. Um, because life, you always want to grow and learn. And I think when you're living your greatest life and taking a lot of risk, um, that's when life is most full. Um, so it's going to be kind of a combination of the two, some business advice, but also kind of a little bit of inspirational thoughts as well. Um, and I haven't, um, I like public speaking, but I haven't spoke. I've been kind of focused just on business. So I haven't spoken over a year. Um, but I'm excited to be here, to kind of come out of retirement, um, to be here with this great crowd. Um, so I just wanted to kind of do, um, I think a lot of life is pushing yourself to the fullest. We just have this one life to live. And then my goal is, and I've come close to death a lot, um, but when you come close to death, you have a heightened awareness of life and what's important. And I think to really achieve what you want in life, you're going to have to get out of your comfort zone. You're going to have to take some big chances and you're going to have to push it. Um, and through that, I've taken a lot of calculated risk. And I could, I've had hundreds of failures. This speech is too short to tell you about my failures. But those actually, that's what I've learned the most from. Um, but it's by taking those chances and pushing it that you really grow to the next level. Um, but also, some of the growth I've had is just living a life um, where you're trying to learn and grow and taking those chances. And then the key is, how do you live a life so great, a life so great you don't fear death? Because now I can tell you that I don't fear death at all. I don't really fear anything. And it was only through kind of pushing myself and taking these chances that I got to that level. Um, and then through this quest, I've learned some, some valuable insights. And during this meeting, we're going we're gonna to answer at least two pretty important questions um, that I, I hope will be relevant to you. The first one, it's a small, minor question, but what is the purpose of life? <laughs> what is the goal of life? I am hoping that I'm going to address that. Um, at, uh, but also, there's another, maybe even more poignant, more powerful question. It's one of those eternal questions that's plagued philosophers and theologians for centuries. And that question is this, why? Why do bad things happen to sexy people? <laughs> uh, because is that, you understand. It's a very sexy crowd, but I know some, I know some of you personally. Some bad things have happened to us. But do not worry. For what, you know the saying, what does not kill you makes you sexier. <laughs> something, you know, something like that. Um, but the key is with the right mindset, you can control your life. You can control the event. And that's what I'll be talking about later on when I talk about my personal story. And then people look at me from a distance. You know, I've been ranked number one team in America, number one individual. Last year was a record year. We did over 850 million. It looks to me like it's all success. But actually, it, it's the hardships that launched me here. It's taking those chances. And that's what I offer to you. Live that great life where you just push yourself to the moment. And then personally, you're going to become very fulfilled because you have this one life you need to live for yourself. But you're going to find that your personal happiness and your personal authenticity is going to translate and spill over into your professional life. And part of the reason that I think I'm doing so well professionally is because I'm authentic. I've just stopped caring. I can't, life is so short. It could end at any moment. I know that that I can't care what people think about me. And that freedom sets you free. 
And that freedom is what launches you, whether it's in the boardroom, more importantly on the dance floor of life. Um, <laughs> but that's the key in life, is to find that freedom as quickly as you can, because every moment you're not free is a moment that you're not fully living to the great life. Um, so let me just do a little bit of kind of some professional thoughts on kind of what helped me launch. Um, but I think the key is look into, well, I'll be speaking a little bit about some things that helped my career and also later on about my life. But even though I'm speaking to myself, I'm just a mirror and I'm a mirror to reflect your own greatness. And when I say my story, envision yourself, what chances you're gonna take, what is your background, how are you gonna maximize that? But I wanna reflect your own greatness. And I'm no different than anyone here but I think some of the hardships I've been through have made me realize how quick life is and I don't have time to waste and I just want to push it farther. And I, we all know we're going to die. It doesn't, hopefully it's 60 years from now, but it might be six months, you don't know. And the key is to live that great life now where you never know where it's going to end and I want tomorrow to be amazing because I might be hit by a bus tomorrow. I have bad luck with moving vehicles, you'll find out. Um, so we'll do a little, a um, couple more. Um, so how did, when did I start real estate? So I started real estate about 17 years ago. I had no benefits. I, I, grew, I was in Palo Alto, I was an attorney there, um, but I didn't grow up there. I didn't really know anyone. But I just wanted, um, I knew I loved real estate, and I also had a different vision of what I thought it could be. And I said, when I leave law, I wanna create something different. I, don't, I wanna sell homes in a way that works for me. But before I entered real estate, I really thought about what can I offer that's different? Um, I had the pleasure of speaking earlier today with Pete um, from Bailey Properties. He mentioned in Santa Cruz, there's 1,400 people in your region and there's a generally about 200, 1,400 agents, about 250 active homes. So we have a lot of people chasing very few listings. Where I am in Palto, it's even worse. There you have about 1,500 people chasing generally about 50 homes on the market. So I thought, how can I differentiate myself? How can I sell more than one home a year? And I really thought about, and, and it's an intersection of what are your greatest strengths and what does the market need? Um, so it's twofold, you wanna come together. And what I realized is, rather than trying to be everything to everybody, I wanted to specialize. I think the key to real estate in the future is to be the best in your area of expertise. The people, the problem with real estate um, is, that, oh, uh, is that we try to be a jack of all trades. We try to do everything and by being a jack of all trades, you're a master of none. Where most of us in this room, um, I until, you know, people will try to list homes, they'll try to buy homes, they'll try to lease homes, and they'll do it, they'll sell in Carmel, they'll sell in San Jose. I think the key is you wanna be the best in your little niche area. So what I realized is, how can I create a different kind of business model or focus, but also tailor it? And I wanted to be the biggest fish in the small pond. Um, and I want it to be distinct and unique. Because again, it's a, so many agents chasing so few listings, how do you stand apart? And how do you be distinct and unique? You can go a little more. Um, and there's so many people in this world, you need to stand apart. Um, so what I wanted to do is I said, I'm just gonna focus, I wanted to create a model that would appeal to me. I think the problem we can have sometimes as agents is we're in the industry and that's all, we just kind of look at it from our perspective. But when I was starting out and still now, I wanted to take a step back and said, imagine you're the client, you're a buyer or you're a seller, what would you want? What is missing in the marketplace and then create that? And for myself, I was undergraduate before law school at Berkeley, I was mathematics and economics. I'm very analytical, my father was a mathematics professor. But the agents in Palo Alto, they weren't really providing me with any analysis. I wanted some really kind of insight into what's the best time of year to buy a home which cities have more appreciation than others? Within those cities, which neighborhoods are seeing the, the greatest amount of new construction and appreciation? People weren't being very analytical about real estate. And I thought in Silicon Valley, where everyone's a nerd, people want this data. Uh, they are, <laughs> they're not, uh, um, but they want this data. And I thought that was something that I could give them. So what I did is I kind of created something, um, like attracts like, so you're gonna attract people who are like you. And what you wanna do is you wanna create if you think if you were a consumer in the marketplace and something's missing, you want to create that. Um, so what I did is I created a very analytical approach to real estate. Um, so what I have, um, and that actually people in this room might benefit from a little bit, is I started my career with buyers. Um, because when you're a newer agent, you want to focus on working with buyers. Um, I've had so many people, they enter real estate, 
Um, and then uh, go back a little bit. Maybe. Um, and then they want to kind of work with sellers. But you want to work at first with buyers. Um, but also I wanted to attract attention. Um, so what I did is I created a bold advertising campaign to attract attention to myself. Because I figured everyone in the world tries to, people try not to offend anyone in their marketing. But instead you want to attract people. Um, so I had this, um, and you just want to attract, if you attract 10% of people in your audience in your marketplace, you're doing well. And I remember in, in college, I actually had, I surfed a lot. I had really long, blonde, curly hair. Um, it was quite unique looking. And then this one woman, she's like, Ken, you think you're so smart? Only 10% of women like guys with long hair. I go, I know, I know. But, on, but only 5% of guys have it. I'm doubling my odds. <laughs> and then I'm just, you gotta be that niche player. And all the women who want long hair, I was their guy. And then it worked out well. And then eventually I had to, you know, but I didn't sell out, I bought in when I cut my hair. Um, <laughs> but that's the key, be yourself and also be distinct and play your niche. So I thought, when I get it, getting out there, how do you create a brand identity where you're unique? Because everyone, you flip the pages, everyone looks the same. And I thought about, let me create some ads that are distinct, capture some attention. So these are some ads I came up with. Um, you want your realtor to be a rock star, and I'm dressed up you know, in a kind of crazy Elvis costume. Um, I love playing on the Da Vinci, the Trubian man, anatomy of a, of a great realtor, and I kind of, you know, sharp mind, left brain, right brain, broke it all down. And then I just got continued to get a little more, um, stand out, and then I go again. Um, that's it. And then I started getting a little crazier. <laughs> hey, everybody remembers the village people, YMCA. Um, so I figured, let me do sold. And I, I got, you know, I got some calls. I remember like, uh, um, you know, grandma's probably not gonna pick me from this ad. But the key is the people who like this ad, they're gonna be people I wanna work with. Um, so I wanna just, I wanted creative young people and I figured let me set myself apart um, through these unique ads to kind of stand apart. Um, and then, uh, but then uh, once I got the attention, what do you do with it? And then that's, I think you wanna convey expertise and also you wanna differentiate yourself. And for the first five years of my career, I pretty much solely focused on buyers. Um, why, as a newer agent, should you focus on buyers? Because buyers will judge you on enthusiasm and expertise. You can win that battle. But sellers are gonna judge you on experience. How many homes have you sold in my neighborhood? How many homes have you sold last year? You're gonna lose that argument. So I figured, let me work on buyers, become the best buyer's agent I can, and then eventually my buyers will make me a listing agent as they trade up. But at the start, I just wanted to focus solely on buyers. And what did I create that was different? Again, I took a step back and said, what would I want? And I'm very analytical, so I started creating neighborhood guides. Um, so, you know, for, I actually own some property in the Santa Cruz area. I was trying to decide, like, which is gonna have more appreciation, Seabright or the Harbor area? What trends are driving those markets? I couldn't find that, but that's kind of what I did for Palto. If you go to my website, you'll see I have detailed neighborhood videos of about 50 of the neighborhoods within Silicon Valley. And it's just two to three minutes, but I'll talk about the neighborhood. Um, you know, the homes here are generally two and a half to three million dollars, about $1,500 a square foot, but also trends. This neighborhood's out of the flood zone. By being out of the flood zone, you can therefore build a basement. If you have the basement, developers know this, you're seeing more new construction in Old Palto than you are in other neighborhoods. And because of this, I project above average appreciation. If I give them real analysis on a neighborhood by neighborhood, um, I really break it down for them. And also on buyers, I think sometimes we kind of stumble into a buyer. You meet them at an open house and you just presume they're gonna like you. But instead, I took a step back and thought of, what does every buyer want? And I answered all those questions and I wrote 100 plus pages of articles. You know, what, you know, how do you get a home below market value? And I kind of wrote out all the ways you can do it. You know, what are, prop, you know, what are property taxes? What are Prop 60, 90? It was anything I could think of, 1031 exchange. Just write detailed articles on it. So that way, when I would, I would have buyers and they say, Ken, I'm, I like you, but I'm also interviewing two or three other people. I would take my 200 pages worth of articles I've written, I'd put it down on the table, i go, who's your daddy? Who's your daddy? Because buyers like, you gotta control the clients, how about client control? Um, <laughs> but the key is, when buyers saw all that information, I, start, I stopped tracking, but I was over 30 plus buyers were like, Ken, we like you, but we're interviewing other people. I was 100% in getting all those buyers. Because on the listing side, we're used to being prepared. You have your market analysis, your CMA, your marketing plan, but on buyers, we kind of just wing it, and we shouldn't. Buyers are, they're easy money in the sense of listings, and I'll get to our business model on listings, 
but that's a lot of effort to promote your listings, a lot of cash. Buyers are just your time, and if you're efficient, then you can save your time. So before I had a team, I did 275 million in 2011, a harder economy, um, but 175 million of that was just buyers. Um, and that was before I had, I just had two assistants. So some people are like, how do you do 175 million with buyers? And the key was by having, your clients actually don't want to bother you, but they have a question they need it answered. But if all the questions, either video or your writing, they're all there, your clients aren't going to call you because they just need to be informed. So it takes some time to create these materials, but once you have these materials, I just have to update them a little bit every year for changes in valuation, but pretty much I'm done. So I was able to do 175 million just solely when buyers, just be me myself as an individual agent, through efficiency, about leveraging your time, and that's where videos last forever, even written word lasts forever, so it's so efficient to do so. And then also on buyers, the key is think about who your clients are and what are the problems. And if you can solve your clients' problems, they love you. And for example, my clients are probably pretty much your clients, because I know a lot of people come over the hill. Very successful, but very busy people. These are people who value their time more than money. So if you can ideally save them both, but especially if you can save them time, um, they love you. But also I looked at, I want to make my clients the most money possible. The best deals were fixer-uppers, but my clients were like, hey, I'm working 70 hours a week, I have children, I don't have time for fixer-upper. So I hired a construction consultant um, and his sole job is to go through the home and to tell clients, okay, because client, people don't like uncertainty. They're going to ask, how much does it cost? How long will it take to remodel? Who do I call? And if you can provide all that information, this bathroom's going to cost 15000 this kitchen's going to cost thirty, dollars um, and he's running it through. This is the team we're going to assemble. I packaged for my clients where all of a sudden I took the weight off their shoulders, and then we can kind of help them with remodeling through my construction consultant and all these good deals that my clients were getting um, and I could package it. And then also we have an interior designer on staff as well. We just give, buyers get three free hours. It's so cheap to give three free hours, but like it's such a differentiating point. Um, but by providing all these things, I looked at what are the pain points for my clients and how can I solve them? And if you can solve your clients, whatever the problems are, lack of knowledge, lack of time, if you can solve that, they're gonna love you and they'll never leave you. Um, question? All the time, please, I love questions. <laughs> okay, two questions, number one. Oh, I, I only said one question, I'm sorry, you're already out. <laughs> Anyone else? <laughs> no, just. <laughs> uh, number one, <coughs> if you have a buyer that specifically buys or looks at these buyers, and number two, what would be an unseen but unsaid buyer that you could add to your list that you could save time? Perfect, no, great questions. So, <laughs> did I sign a buyer, have my client sign a buyer broker agreement? <laughs> no, not yet. Um, my, what I, my stance with my buyers would be like, I want to be the best for you. I want to create the, the most insight, the most knowledge, and provide the best service. And if I don't, I want you to have the freedom to leave me. Um, I think it's an awkward conversation to make a buyer sign a buyer broker agreement. So to pr at present, we haven't. That being said, the market is changing. People are less loyal than they used to be. Um, we work, we have um, a kind of a division that speaks Mandarin. Um, if you're from China, particularly those buyers tend to have even less loyalty, um, where they might ask for a discount at the last moment. <laughs> Shut the fuck up. Um, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, but we, uh, um, so we've toyed with the idea of buyer broker agreements, but at present, our defection rate is below 5%, so we're not doing it, but it is growing. It went from like 2% to, to like 4% leaving us, or like we're asking for a discount, we fire them either or. Um, but if that number climbs, I'm, I'm open to it, but I'm hoping to just kind of become keep on evolving and providing so much service they don't need to leave me. Um, so how many homes to show a buyer? Before I, when I, before I show them homes, I'll ask them, how many homes do you want to buy? If they say two homes, I'll show them two homes. If they say one home, like, that's, here's the home. Uh, <laughs> I mean, if you're buying more, I'll show you more. Um, <laughs> no, uh, kidding aside, um, pro Silicon Valley is probably the hardest place to be a buyer's agent, um, just because in Santa Cruz, you're gonna have more inventory we literally have like that week's inventory and then they all got multiple offers and they're gone. So it might take a while, but usually maybe like 10 to 20 homes. Um, but I try to be, buyers wanna buy. There's that phrase, buyers are liars. I don't like that phrase. I think buyers are some of the best people in the world. They just wanna feel comfortable that they're not getting taken advantage of, that they're getting a good value and price. And you can, sell, you can give them that knowledge one of two ways. You can show them a ton of homes, they have all this data, or you can just give them the data and really expedite the process. Um, so I try to speed things up as much as possible. 
um, by giving them as much data and insight as possible. Here's the neighborhoods. Let's kind of let's go macro level. You're looking at Menlo Park and Palo Alto. Pros and cons. Micro level. Then these are the neighborhoods. Um, but by giving them all that information, it accelerates the curve, and I think that they're more open to, um, you know, acting quickly. Um, Silicon Valley is hard. Where when I say 10 to 20 homes, but hopefully they'll write an offer after like eight homes. But our area is competitive, where you know might get five or ten offers and they might not get it. But I'd say overall, 10 to 20 homes, three to six months is probably our average. Average price point's like three and a half. Um, smart people, they can be cautious, but um, know your clients. Our techies, if you give them all the data and analysis, you can they can become more confident and they trust you. And uh, you'll hear in you know in 15 minutes about some of the life experiences I've had, um, but. I'm, I've been kind of gotten close to death a few times. I'm not that motivated by money, just because like, you know, when you come, you know, just like you realize what's important. But I think when clients, the great irony is when you don't care about money, the money just comes to you. Because trust, I think what would a buyer value? Expertise, strong number two. But trust in you is number one. That you have their interests ahead of your own. I never care about the sale. I never, you know, whether next, this year we're targeting a billion, whether we sell a billion, or a billion and three million, I don't care. Um, I just want the buyer to be happy. But I think if you, if the clients know you're happy, and you can phrase it in so many ways, and just like, oh, this home's not for you, but I'm gonna show it to you as a data point, maybe in six months when the price comes down, we'll get it, but never push the clients, um, and then in the end, you're gonna make a lot more money because they're gonna love you, they know you, they trust you, and you'll make it up in referrals. Um, any other thoughts on buyers? That was a great, qu great question. So then in the end, let's be honest. We all wanna be listing agents. Um, so, how do you become a listing agent? And then how do you become the preeminent listing agent? And especially, you know, get the beautiful, you know, ocean fronts, you know, five to $10 million ones. So for myself, for one, I was just patient, waiting for my buyers to take me there. But then once I started getting listing appointments, listings can be so valuable in the sense of a good listing should get you one or two buyers. Um, and, but you want to have as high of a price point as possible. And many of you already know this, but um, I've worked, I've sold homes, you know, up to 100 million. The, the, the very high-end clients are actually easier to work with. They're very bright, they're very experienced, they know what they want. All you have to do is find that right home. It might involve you know, renting a helicopter and looking at homes, but you just gotta find the right home. But they're ready to buy. It's the low-end people that are harder. So I want as many kind of upper-end you know, sellers as we can get. So how do you get there? Well, especially at the start, when you don't have very many listings, kind of plan ahead and jump up where I would go and I'd get a $2 million listing, but I'd blow it up. I would, you know, never discount your commission, but don't be afraid to go big in the marketing to grab that, to get that listing. So I would treat a $2 million listing like a $4 million listing. And that one, now usually I would get the $2 million listing as a result of that. Maybe I'd net less per transaction, but I'd get that deal. But then when I had the $4 million listing appointment, I can show them this is what I did for this house. Imagine what I can do for yours. But I would treat the $4 million like a $6 million listing and then this is at the start, now we can just treat a $4 million listing like they're lucky to talk, uh, we're talking to them. Um, but, uh, but at the start, kind of build up um, and really you know, have that portfolio because if you have these great listings, um, so much is gonna happen. But uh, what is our model for on the listing side? I can explain our business model in six words. You blow in, you blow up, and then you blow out. So we, our, our median days on market is nine for our listings, nine. It's not a coincidence that it's so low. We say um, no to about a third of the potential listings we could have. Um, you know how in college they said, uh, just say no? I really believe in just say no. I'm a strong proponent of that. So in college, you know how they spell no, right? K-N-O-W, just say no, you gotta know your drugs. Know the right ones, know the, oh, that's sorry, that's a different. Um, but, but also in real estate, just say no. Um, what happens all the time, you'll go to the listing appointment, the, the seller's like, this is just cutting through everything. They're saying, my home, I want you to overprice it by 20% because my kids grew up here, therefore it's worth 20% more than the, the market says. And then I want you to spend all this money, I want you personally to be here, and then when you waste all your time and all the money and it doesn't sell, I can't wait to tell the neighborhood how terrible you are. Will you take my listing? Oh yes, yes, I'll take your listing. No, the answer is no, you will not take that listing. So we say no a third of the time and we're walking out the door. But half the time when we're walking out the door, they're like, oh, you literally won't take our listing. Like, no, it's overpriced, it won't sell. Oh, well actually, no, then, then we'll be realistic, we want you. Um, but even if they let you walk out the door, 
you didn't lose a listing. You saved yourself you know, time and aggravation. And all we have in the end is our time. So blow in, blow up, blow out. Where um, I'm, my former training, I was a lawyer. Lawyers were used to dollar per hour. And I think in real estate, one of the flaws we make is people don't want to invest in our listings. Like, well, I can't invest $10,000 in this listing. But I'm like, hey, if I invest $10,000 in uh, a $3 million listing, we always charge 3%, and I make 90K, and I sell it in a week, and I only invested 30 hours, and I netted 80,000 divided by 30, you know, 20, you know, $2,700 an hour, it pays, the bill, pays for gas. Um, but I would always, I would do hourly. Because, and then the key is, I'll just, I don't mind spending a lot of money up front if I know the home's gonna sell. And it's better for everybody. I look like a rock star. The home sells in nine days, it jumped a half a million above list price. It was fun. I get so bored when they don't sell. It's just not worth your time. Um, but be very selective. Because again, it's all about your time. And then it's funny too, referrals, um, with clients, be very pr particular about who you pick as clients. Because when you're picking your clients, you're picturing, picturing your future clients too. You're picking them as well. Because assholes know assholes. <laughs> and great people know great people. But if you have that terrible client who's a pain to work with, when they refer you to someone else, that person's also gonna be terrible. <laughs> so I just want the great people. And by, you know, most people, you know, at the upper end, they're on the listing side, they charge two and a half. We charge three. But we provide so much more, so we think it works out well. Um, but the key is, by actually charging more, we get rid of the penny pinchers. The people who are like, Nick, I'm dying you. To, like, no, you're, you're the big picture. We're the best. We're gonna sp we charge more, but we're going to spend more. We're going to get you net more. And you believe in our model or you don't. But know your model, believe in it. And then have a really strong you know, value proposition. But I think I can honestly say, I think we provide the most to our, our sellers when it's a good fit. Um, and then just find those right people. But be very aggressive in your marketing but also be very selective in who you take, and that's the best way to kind of make a lot of sales. Um, and then also, <coughs> have a vision. My vision, too, was we were kind of the two to four million dollar guys. Um, I have a really good, I own the business, but my, I have a business partner who helps me a lot. But we were kind of known as two to four million. I wanted the upper end, but how do we get it? And then we took a step back and said, what do, what do high end sellers want? And then we created separate branding. We have daily owned platinum. Platinum if you're over five million. And then once we created this, um, originally the year before, um, we had about five sales over, over five million in the first six months. We created platinum. The next six months we had 17 sales over five million. And it's just, but we took a, we thought of what do buyer, you know, high end sellers want and we created that. And we're not, you know, on a high end home, we might spend 30, 40,000. But if we're netting, you know, 450, it's fine. Um, so it's just kind of not, not be afraid to reinvest in, in the clients and then also in your career. Um, but big picture, don't be afraid to take calculated risk. Um, keep going. Um, oh, actually, I do a, a lot of, oh, actually, um, I'm not sure if how many of you have investment properties, but I'd highly recommend it. Um, I do a lot of flips myself. Um, I also own investment properties. You know the reasons to own investment properties, probably from a tax perspective, depreciation, we get active losses instead of passive losses. But the best reason to own investment property, ever since I've started owning investment properties, I don't have to go to therapy anymore. That whole anger management, it's not a big deal. Because, you know, February 2nd, bam, 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 where's my money? You're two days late with the rent. I get such happiness talking to my tenants. <laughs> so that's, that's why you should own investment property. Just get it all up, just, it's, oh, it's cathartic, it feels good. Um, sorry, go on. Um, but I do own a, a lot. Um, but just to give you my trajectory, in nine years, I started out as an individual, made number one agent in America. But then I thought, let me try to, life is about constant growth. So then I started my own company. I was with Coldwell Banker and Keller Williams, two great companies. But I wanted to start my own company. And we're just continuing to try to kind of evolve and grow and innovate and change. But it just feels good to kind of not stagnate. You want to keep on pushing it. We have kind of a more of a team-based model, um, but, it's, um, but it's always changing, always evolving. Next one. Um, you can go further. I have too many slides, sorry. Go. So oh, just also, too, life is time. Um, so life is so short, you want to really leverage your time. So for those of you who don't yet have an assistant, I would say that should be one of the first things that you invest in. 
Um, I had a, got an assistant after my second year in the business. It, my production didn't really justify it, but I just thought I need to leverage myself and get up there. And also one time I was at the copy machine, got a paper cut. Oh my, oh like I right to the ER. It was, it was like, I'm like never, paper is just a terrible thing. You got you should never touch it. Um, but I did get that first assistant and there's that old saying, um, feel the dreams. If you build it, they will come. I didn't, my production didn't justify having an assistant, but I had an assistant, it freed me up. I was able to network more with clients. I got more business. First eight months in the business, I had zero sales. Next um, eight months, 20 million. And it's just part of it was having that assistant to allow me to leverage myself and to do what you're greatest at. And then life is just time. And I'm always about dollar per hour. And you, can't, you can buy everything in life, but you can't buy your time back. Um, so I'm very important um, to really save your time as much as possible. And also on marketing, I've always been very aggressive in my marketing where if you look at my production for that year, I, th I don't know the steady is like maybe 10 or 20% of your money should be spent on marketing. We spend more like 25 or 30. Um, but uh, the key is every year we're usually, last year we jumped 120 million. Well, I'm just, I'm marketing for two years from now. And I would go to these Keller Williams events and I would tell them some of the, you know, the money we spend on listings. And people are like, I can't, he's, he's gonna go bankrupt. I'm like, yeah, no, it's, it's but I mean, it's just the, People love it and you keep on you know, investing in yourself. But get, you know, do what you're greatest at. I think one of the reasons I'm doing well in life is I have a lot of weaknesses, but I don't do any of them at work. Because if you're not great, you delegate. Cynthia, my right-hand woman, she does um, poor organization. I like everything I'm bad at, I don't do. Um, but that way, it's just it's a good feeling. It's life as it should be lived when you're only doing what you're greatest at. That's your highest and best use of your time. So I would say do invest um, in yourself. Any questions on real estate before I transition to inspiration? Please. <coughs> no, great question. Um, more or less, in Silicon Valley, given that there's so few sales, how do you create a narrative around these very few data points? I can tell you're analytical as well. Um, so a lot of times, and then and when the market changes and things like that, you know, you're only supposed to look back like three months for comps, but um, I'll try to do is I'll try to interpolate. Um, we'll all look at past data and kind of adjust for the market and kind of draw graphs. Um, so I'll use as much analysis as I can. And part of it is too, like whatever advantage you have um, utilized. Um, one thing is too, at, at my company now, we really specialize. Big picture, I run my company like a law firm where we have a team of specialists instead of one person trying to do everything. And I, I solely focus on buyers. I know it's a little rare, almost everybody wants it, um, but, but by focusing on buyers, I get to, I'm kind of firsthand, and I see all the data. I see there's kind of the empirical data, but also there's a lot of psychological, what's the temperature of the buyers, how's the climate. I actually think right now is a great time to buy because I think that people, buyers are in kind of the negative psyche of the stock market from December and January, but you look at the fundamentals, you know, NASDAQ's recovered um, pretty well, interest rates are taking a dip, the lowest unemployment we've seen in a long time. Silicon Valley is just this little bubble where we're still the epicenter of innovation technology. Um, but I'll try to give a lot of insight to my clients based on empirical data, but also kind of what I'm seeing out there in the marketplace. Um, and just by, by being a specialist just in buyers, I really know their psyche and then I can really kind of um, speak of what they're looking for. Also one thing that's just kind of, speaking of investing yourself, I've been very accurate in projecting trends um, that this city is gonna appreciate more than this city um, because of what's going on in Silicon Valley. But part of it is I know who my clients are. Um, Silicon Valley is very cosmopolitan, as you know. But I've been to China about seven times, India several times, Vietnam many times, Japan, Singapore, Russia. But anywhere my clients have come from, I'll go to that country, I'll study that business model. How much is it dollar per square foot? How much are commissions? Do they have a buyer's agent? Do they have an MLS? But just as an example, Something I learned in my travels, my clients were from India, they all want to be in the Los Altos Hills. My clients were from China, they want to be in Palo Alto, right in the heart of downtown. And I couldn't, both were new money, I couldn't quite figure out this radical difference. But I went in China, and if you're a billionaire, you live on the penthouse of your own building. But if you're in the country, that's where the poor people live, you don't live, you know, away from the downtown. But in India, you think China's crowded, India is about one third the size and the same population. It is so densely populated, and so much kind of like, Lo, you know, true third world, the rich people want to be in the hills. They want to separate themselves from all the masses going down below. So then I understood, oh, okay, my clients from India want the hills because in 
that's true of their homeland. But just as a sense of try to understand who your clients are, their problems, and then even their mindset, where they're coming from. And through that, and actually I've been able to predict which cities are going to have more appreciation just because I'm seeing the changing demographics of Silicon Valley. Um, so that way when clients ask you a question, you can answer. Um, let me, uh, I was going to do analysis for you, but, um, but any other questions about real estate? But I think the key is find what's great for you and then look at the marketplace and what's missing and what void can you fill and then become expert in that. Um, and I think, but differentiate yourself from others. We were very n narrow focused. Um, we'll never be in Santa Cruz. I'll never compete against you. We only were in Palo Alto and we're about five miles around Palo Alto. Um, we're, we do a billion dollars, almost a billion, in that little, little area. But we turned down a ton of listings outside of it because if we're not the best, you know, what, it's a disservice to the client and we lose all our competitive advantages. But by being that specialized, we really feel like we know that market. Please. Right, no, it's a good, <clears throat> and I think if, if you can always have the client's best interest at heart, um, you're, gonna, you're gonna do well. Um, but your dollars per hour, we're speaking on the listing side. So the, the interesting part is, I actually, I only recommend to clients what I would recommend for myself, personally doing. Um, which is, if you, those, how many of you have read the book Freakonomics? It's a really good book. Um, and you might, there's a section you should read just in case your sellers bring this up against you. Um, but it was a University of Chicago economist, and what, one of the studies he did was that when agents listed their own homes, they tended to come on really high and then stay for a while and then sell after like six months, but for a high dollar per square foot. But when they listed other people's homes, they came on lower, sold quicker, um, and sold for a le lower dollar per square foot. And what he put forward is here where the agent only has a 3% motivation they just want to get it done. They're not going to hold out for the top dollar. Um, but when they have clients, um, you know, when the, you know, clients, they let them go, but their own 100% motivated, then they really stick it out. Um, so clients will oftentimes say that to you and be like, you're just trying to price it low and therefore get the quick sale. And, I, and they usually cite Freakonomics. And I always congratulate them on their brilliance that they know the steady. But the, what the steady is really is saying is that whatever your agent is doing for their own listings, you should do for yourself. That's what they're saying. They're not saying the model changes per city, per dynamics, but they're saying that whatever an agent does for their own listings, you should do for yourself. And then I talk about what I've done. And I've sold about maybe 10 homes in the last five years. All those homes I grossly underpriced. I had one recently. I thought it was worth, this was last year, a stronger market a little bit. I thought it was worth 22 to 23. I priced it at 1788. It jumped to 265. Um, I, there was a home that you saw in the video back there earlier. It was actually a flip I did, just to give you the numbers. I bought it off market for a little over 2.5. I put 300K into it. It was probably worth, so I'm in it for a little over 2.8. It's probably worth 3.1. What's a developer gonna do? Price it at 3.3 and then have it sell for 2.9 because people do the math. Oh, that's, they're being greedy. I priced it, at, I priced it below my purchase price. I priced it at 2.488. I said, whatever the market brings, the market brings. And that was, I've seen my clients, developers, they always overprice and they make a mistake. It was listed for 2488, it jumped over a million to 3.5. I made over 700K on that one flip. Um, but the key was I wasn't greedy. Um, I priced it below, but I, I did what I would have recommended for my clients. So I think, so the dollar per hour, I don't mind, I don't mind it when everybody wins. Um, I don't mind winning if everyone around me is winning. Um, and that's where the key is. The client actually, it's in the seller, below five million, at least in Palo Alto and surrounding cities, it's in the seller's best interest to price below market value create an auction dynamic and to sell, um, you know, price 10% below market value and get a 15 or 20% leap. That's the best. And the, the irony is the homes that are overpriced, they actually, they stay there, they get a stigma and they sell for below market value. Homes that are underpriced, auction dynamic, irrational bidding, sell for above market value. And we, we treat our clients as brilliant people that they are and we explain the model and we'll say, we'll do whatever you want to do or not, we're going to leave. Um, but, but this is what we'd recommend. About 90% of our listings are vacant. They're like, oh, I, I want to stay here. I, I just, it's easier. I'm like, that's, feel free to stay. If you won't mind losing $200,000 because it's harder to show and it doesn't show as well, that's your decision. 200,000, yeah, no, I'd, 
I'd recommend staying in a hotel, but it's your choice. Oh no, we're going. But we got our cat. We'll kill the cat. You got, do you want 200,000 <laughs> <laughs> or not? Um, but about 90% of our listings are vacant, which is in the client's interest. And oh, by the way, it kind of helps us because it makes our life easier because it's vacant as well. And they're more motivated to sell. Um, but it's in their best interest. But I don't mind. I always try to find people go zero sum too often. And actually, the key is how can you win together? How can you win together with the clients? And then to find that, it's like the dance floor. The greater the dancers are around you, the greater I am. It's not a, it's not a zero sum competition. We all rise or fall together. Great question. One more question? I, I forget, I'll write you on. Um, oh, you were saying, okay, so you only specialize in how often is the listing, but you represent buyers always. Buyers will represent in a greater latitude, but still not too far. Okay. Like, I've never sold in San Francisco, I've never sold in. San Jose, I don't ever want to. And you, you, you have to, people specialize in certain areas. So if someone says they're, they want to go to Los Altos Hills, you have a Los Altos Hills expert? Yes. Right. So we're a little different too, that we really make our employees specialize in a certain area. Um, and it's just like, if you look at law, medicine, people, you're expert at your niche, and all you do is your niche. And when I was at the largest law firm in Silicon Valley, Wilson Sonsini, all I did was trademark, um, trademark and patent law, um, but then I was great at it. Um, so same concept. Any other great questions? Okay. So where did I get the courage to take these chances? And then also how can you get this courage as well? Because it's this one life we have, let's make it amazing. And it's actually, I've had four hardships um, that I'm gonna share with you um, a little on the quicker side, just because of time constraints. Um, but these are what has launched me. Um, and then the first one I'm gonna share with you is actually the hardest, because um, I've had three things happen to me. You know, I can handle it. Um, but the first one involves some I lost. But let me talk about fears real quick, too, as well. Um, my tragedies have helped me overcome fear. And fear is the biggest limiter in your life. And what you'll find is 90% of fears in life and limits are self-imposed. And if you can break those, those barriers, there's no ceiling to what you can achieve. So you just kind of have to constantly push yourself about what it would probably be one of the biggest, um, I'd say, what would be the second biggest fear that people have in life? I'd say fear of failure. It's just embarrassing to fail. You don't want to talk about it. It's a setback. But I've, I've reversed that in my life. Instead of fear of failure, I have love of failure. Because I know it's the failure where the lessons are. It's that whole mantra where if you didn't fall and scheme, you didn't try hard enough. I constantly am pushing myself. I'm constantly falling dusting myself off, and what can I learn? But, you know, fail fast, fail forward. These are the principles that made Silicon Valley great. And by overcoming my fear of failure, it let me get through the final fear. The greatest fear in life, and this is the driver, I think, of a lot of people, is fear of death. And why do people fear death? Many reasons, but I think it's a sense of, I didn't leave a legacy. And I've overcome my fear of death by trying to, as best possible, leave my legacy by being my true authentic self, being the best father I can be, being the best agent I can be to my clients, best boss I can be to my employees, and to, my, and to everyone around me. But it's just, the key is, by leaving this legacy where I've you know, spoken to tens of thousands of high school students, and get, you'll see in a moment why high school students are important to me, but I feel like if I die tomorrow, that my life, my body dies, but my thoughts and my actions live on. And through knowing that I'll eternally live through my children or just through these thoughts, it takes away fear of death. And the great irony in life is once you no longer have fear of death, that's when life truly begins. That's when you just open your wings up and soar to the next level. But sometimes it's the hardships that get you there. And then the first one I'm going to talk about, oh, and then, sorry, risk real quick. Um, but just people are risk averse. And you've got to take calculated risk in life. So if you look at me, I have a lot of confidence. I wasn't always this way. I gave myself confidence. The reason I gave myself confidence, and I've written a book um, It's not fully complete yet, almost complete. My documentary is complete. Um, but the book um, goes through my life, and it's actually dedicated to my sister. And it says, this book is dedicated to my sister Jane, because her premature death led to the birth of the self-proclaimed genius. And that's what I called myself for a while, the self-proclaimed genius. Because in life, you should proclaim your own greatness. You can't wait for others to do it for you. And Jane, you'll see oh, uh, a video I created. But just to give you, she was better than I was. She was more brilliant, more beautiful, I thought, um, more everything. 
but she lacked self-confidence. And then when her boyfriend broke up with her, it was too much for her. And that haunts me forever. But the thing was, I took that little bit of difference between us, which was confidence, and I've just amplified it. And I've tried to kind of, her, well, actually, we'll play the video. Um, sorry, it's about a four minute video. Jane really acted as a second um, mother to me, where you know, because my parents were divorced, my mother had a full time job. We spent a lot of time alone, just the two of us. We were basically close, but when Jane started hanging out with my high school friends, and we got a little bit farther apart, um, and then I saw her get really involved with her boyfriend and then lose her friends, and my father lose her son. And that's when I was starting to get worried about Jane. She suffered from depression at one point in time. Penn had found her with an overdose of pills around the holidays. He had the presence of mind, even as a 14-year-old, to get her up and make a walk. She made him promise never to tell us. I mean, 14-year-olds don't keep his promise out of life with sister. But when we thought she was coming out of it during the holiday, Labor Day weekend, uh, she wanted to see a boyfriend. We gave her key, she just passed her driver's license, which was a big victory. So of course she wanted to borrow a car, she borrowed dad's car. They did me, we don't know what can say. <coughs> uh, and of course we found her later. It was around 11.30, and as it would happen, Ken was the first one into the house, he was the quickest. We thought she'd be in her bedroom. She wasn't. That's was the first room he went to. We started to call her name. There was no response. The house was dark. Ken made it to the kitchen, turned on the light. So it was the first time in his life. We were running after him. It was probably a good five feet ahead of us. And then we came to the garage. Ken saw her first. I felt this momentary sense of relief for the light in the kitchen reflected off the trunk of the car and the hood on which she, she stayed, she made it. And I heard the engine was running, flipped on the light, and it's not seeing slumped over, slumped over the steering wheel, ashen white. I thought she was still alive. I yelled, she needs air, she needs air, she needs air. Open the garage door. Push back the car, put the windows down. Uh, we looked at it. <coughs> we saw Jane. Well, that was the first day of our new life, all of us. So losing Jane was the hardest thing of my life, as you can imagine. Um, <clears throat> but it was from that and that desperation and sadness I felt, where how can I have the shattered sense of self I had? How can I make something positive out of this negative? And this was the hardest thing I had, and it took me six years. But what I built upon, for one, is that Jane wouldn't want me to suffer. She would want me to go. And then also, though, how can I learn from this? And again, it was that sliver of difference, which I had self-confidence and she didn't. And I took that sliver of difference and I just amplified it. And I said her fatal flaw is letting other people de determine who she is and her identity and her happiness. And I'm going to proclaim my own greatness. Greatness comes from inside out. I'm not going to let anyone define me. I'm going to learn from my sister's loss. And I tried to carry her inside of me, and she was the weaker vessel. But uh, you know, her empathy, her intuition, I tried to bring that to me, and I think for a male, I'm very, you know, and just, I try to, how can it learn? My father, he was a math professor, very stoic. Um, and he, my whole life before Jane, he never, um, you know, he told Jane, I think he loved her twice and maybe me twice. Um, but after my sister lost and you just, the last words I said to my sister were, um, I, she called up asking for my mother. My mother was grocery shopping. I go, she's, Jane, she's grocery shopping. And she goes, do you want, you want me to have her call you back? And she goes, no, Ken but I love you, Kenny. And I said, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> I love you too, Jane. And just knowing that the last words I had to her were I love you gave me so much solace and comfort. 
And then my father, who was a stoic, and obviously everyone's devastated as a parent, particularly you blame yourself. I, I blame myself. Um, but I ended every conversation with him with, I love you, Dad. And I did that 50 times, and I love you, Dad. Goodbye, Kenny. I love you, Dad. Goodbye, Kenny. And on the 51st time, I love you. I love you, Dad. I love you too, Kenny. And then just from there on out, we always said it. And just you never know when that moment's going to be, and just to have that. But I think from this loss, what I learned is that it's up to us to determine our lives. And you can't let other people define you, and you can't listen to others. In your whole life, if you're worried what people think, you'll never be free. You'll never truly achieve what you want to achieve. But I've taken this negativity, and I've grown from it, and I've done volunteer speeches to tens of thousands. I've heard losses probably saved you know, a lot of children just through all my speeches. Um, but the key is, what did I learn, and how, what lessons can I convey? But I, what I'm thinking I learned, too, is that, as you can see here, the greatest irony in life is that when you just stop caring what people think about me, um, because after Jane's loss, I'm like, I, I can't care what people think about me. It's not worth it. I was a people pleaser. But once I stopped caring what people thought about me, the more people wanted to be around me, because everybody wants to be free in life. And the great irony is that the greatest gift you can give is freedom, but the way you give other people freedom is by giving it to yourself first. And then when you're free, you can set other people free. And I do this most clearly on the dance floor. Because I've set myself free and I've just stopped caring. And it liberates me and it sets me to the next level. And through this, you know, through this loss, I've learned so much. I've tried to give, you know, I still think of her. I can't bring her back. But what I can do is I can learn from it. I can grow from this and I can get, convey it to others and hopefully save others. Um, but then uh, so many tragedies, so little time. I've learned so many life lessons, but I need to kind of carry forward. Um, but then let me set the scene a little bit on the next, um, next tragedy I've been through. Um, I just graduated from law school um, at Berserkly. Um, had a great time. Um, and then, uh, but then uh, I was going to start at Silicon Valley's largest law firm, but passed the bar and then took a short vacation in Florida before I started the law firm. But on this um, vacation, I went on a walk with my father. And this walk nearly took and forever changed my life. Because my father and I were walking on the sidewalk, a very safe place. There's a street. Um, cars going about 45 miles per hour, but about a 20-foot grass divide between the street and the sidewalk. We're walking along, um, and then with no warning, talking about all the ex how excited I am to move to Palo Alto, but then with no warning whatsoever, a car smashes into my right leg. You can still see the scarring here a little bit. Let's see. Oh, these jeans are tight. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, you can still see the scarring here, um, but just to, nothing in life is free. If you want to touch the scars, it's $5. Kissing's 10. <laughs> I take credit cards, though. Um, but, uh, oh man, these aren't tight. Oh. It's not easy being a hipster and wearing these skinny jeans. Uh, <clears throat> uh, but uh, the force of the car sh um, shattered my fibula and tibia, launched me up, and then actually, you imagine you're just talking to their father, and then the next moment, you, this pain hits you, and I got catapulted up in the air. I smashed through the windshield. Um, I went through the windshield with my shoulder. My head didn't take it, the shoulder, broken arm as I went through, but my head didn't hit the windshield, so I'm no more brain damaged than I was before the accident, <laughs> which is good. But there I end up inside the moving car, and then I'm kind of like smashed into the front seat, and I'm in the worst pain I've ever felt in my life, just screaming in pain, screaming in pain, but then I feel new blows coming down upon me. And I'm kind of, I'm not in shock because my, you know, I've just realized my life's on the line. So with my one broken arm, broken leg, my one good hand, I push myself up, I look to the left, it's a vision I'll never forget. It's my attacker. He's driving with his left hand, and then he's beating me, beating me with his right hand. And I look at him, and he's totally sweating, and his eyes are completely dilated. And I realize he's on some sort of crazy drugs, and my life's on the line. So I start, pleading, start blocking his punches. I start pleading with him, stop the car. I'm hurt. I'm hurt. Stop the car. What are you doing? And he's screaming at me. And we're, at this point, he hit the sidewalk. We're back in the road, weaving in and out of traffic, running red lights. I'm in the car for three miles. And then he's beating me, and he's screaming, get out, get out. Um, we found out later on he was on all sorts of crazy drugs, and he thought I was a demon from the sky who was attacking him. So he's beating me. Of course, you know, what, what other conclusion is there? Um, um, and he's beating me as hard as he can, weaving out of traffic, um, running red lights. But then finally he gets to a red light where there's cars in all three lanes. He can't run this red light, so he stops. The moment he stops with my one good hand, I open the door, but I can't get out, broken arm, broken leg. So then he pushes me out. I fall down on my bad side, and it's really painful, and then he screeches away. Um, and then with my one good hand, I'm waving it in the air, 
And then uh, cops came later on, because my poor father, at this point I'm the only child, my father, he felt a bump on his leg from the car, but thankfully barely just grazed him. But he saw, he looked around for my body, and he used the term body because he thought I had to be dead. Um, but then it's my body, and then he looked and he realized I was in the car. So he started running after the car, thinking my attacker would stop. But then when the attacker kept going, uh, my father looked back. There was a city bus. My father waved down the bus. The bus driver pulled over. My father jumped in the bus and then gave chase. Um, but then when my attacker ran the, all the red lights, my dad had to, the bus driver didn't want to run the red lights. So my dad got out and then called 911. But there I was with my one good hand saying, help me, help me. Two police officers come, and then right when the paramedics are there, and I still remember the two officers towering above me, and they're like, what happened to you? And I go, I was walking with my father. I got hit by a car. I ended up inside the car, and the driver was beating me. And I hear him whisper to his partner, he's in shock. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like, no, no. And I heard them. I go, this is, this is exactly what happened. I repeated to them verbatim. And then they got the 911 call from my father, and they realized that this accident the victim over three miles away on a different street was me. So then they took me to the hospital. But then it gets fortuitous where the police officers who took me to the hospital, they're getting coffee, interviewing my father and I, and they go to the cafeteria and they see two other cops. And they're like, oh, what happened to you? They're like, oh, we just picked up this guy. He was in totally crazy drugs. He was all, you know, we want to take him to jail because of the drugs, but he's all cut up. So we need, we need to take him to the hospital first. And, like, and then my cops were like, what did he look like? And they're like, well, he looks like he had a big tattoo of a cross here, kind of a strong guy, ex-Marine. And they're like, that's the guy who hit him. So they go, Ken, we think we found your attacker, and we need you to identify him. And I'm like, ooh, last time I saw this guy, he was beating me. So you need to, you need to stretch him, you need to strap him down. So they wheel our two gurneys. They wheel our gurneys next to each other. And then we're both lying down, and we look to the left, and I, and I, and I see him, and I go, that's him. And he starts squirming, trying to get away. Um, and then at that point, they did a blood test, and they found out who he was. Just um, two days earlier, he was arrested on felony charges for dealing drugs to a minors, just released on bail in the morning, and then he hit me at 4 p.m., and he was on horse tranquilizers, kind of a special K type of drug, ketamine, um, ecstasy, speed, and marijuana while driving. Um, so that happened. Um, but then, uh, and then maybe we'll just play, but then the key is, if something like that happens to you, and hopefully nothing will, but there'll be some setback you'll face in your life, how do you react? And then let me show you just a quick little news clip, and then I'll talk about how I reacted. It's my friend. My tennis shoe flew out of my tennis shoes. Uh, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> thank you so much. Um, but don't you hate it when the makeup crew is late to the film shoot? I, I mean, I, I look terrible there. I like so a uh, little bit of blush, you know, cover that up. Um, but something like that happens to you. Like literally, I should have died. The statistics say if you're hit, pedestrians being hit by cars over 40 miles per hour, 85% die. Um, but thankfully, I made it. But then how do, you, how do you react? And my initial thoughts, I had this hatred towards my attacker. How could, how could someone do this to me? Even if he was in the state he, he was in, why did he beat me? Why didn't he pull over? But then as I w started feeling this hatred, I realized that to hate my attacker is indirectly to hate me. And I don't ever want to do that. Mwah, mwah, love self, love self. Um, but really, by hating my attacker, um, it's really indirectly saying that who I was before the accident was better than who I am now. And he took something from me and I don't want to give him that power. Another thought you might have is, you could throw yourself the pity party. I was 26 years old, I thought I had everything going for me, and then now all of a sudden, I'm in the, I'm in the hospital, some of the doctors say, you're gonna have a limp your whole life, you might slight chance you'll be in a wheelchair if things don't work well. Um, so, you know, 26 years old, like, what was me? Um, but life, I'm really a big believer in the self-fulfilling prophecy. What you envision is gonna become reality. Whether, if you wanna succeed or not, if you envision success, there's a higher likelihood of succeeding. 
And I just said, my vision was, I'm going to recover from this. I'm going to physically be as strong and psychologically stronger from my attacker. And then the route I took was what you saw there, where that, that video was shot in the newsroom just about three hours after I was hit. So almost nearly dying, but I've already processed that my life has changed, and I, and I love my quote, I just need to move on. I need to focus on what I can do and not what I can't do. And how did I get there so quickly? It was my sister, learning from her. Because it took me six years to get through her, but three hours to get through this and already process it. Because what I realized is my, there's a time in your life you might be fall down and you're flat on your face. And my sister was there. And I just said, if that happens to me, I want to have love of self, acceptance of self, where I can launch myself up. Hopefully friends and family can help you up. But even if they're not there, that you have enough self-love and strength where you can just launch. And through doing that, I was able to process that within three hours. And that's, to me, what shows is that you can't control events. I couldn't control that car hitting me. I couldn't control the cancer it's going to give me. But what I can control is my reaction to that event. And by controlling the reaction, you control the event. Because instead, I said, I'm going to use this event for growth. And this event fundamentally changed my purpose of life. Because before this event, what is the purpose of life? Before this accident, my purpose in life was I want to be happy. I want to be happy and make those around me happy. But when I went through this accident, I was actually very sad for a little bit. But learning all these life lessons, and I could tell becoming wiser, and I saw all the growth that was occurring. I'm like, this isn't, sadness is underrated. And instead of ha happiness being my purpose in life, I changed it. My purpose in life now is growth, change, evolution. I want to grow as much as I can, and then I want to push others to grow as well. And the beautiful part about changing my purpose of life to be growth is that now the full spectrum of life, happiness, sadness, triumph, tragedy, it's all together. Because it's the downturns when you learn the most. And it's the downturns that help you evolve the most and grow the most. And this accident helped me in so many ways. I just realized how short and finite time is, and I just lived a better life. Instead of watching basketball, I played basketball with my you know, instead of watching the show Friends, I hang out with my friends. But life is so short, I just realized how I need to do what I want to do. And this gave me the courage to, you know, I was, I was a lawyer for several years, but I'm like, I need, life is short. I need to find what I'm passionate about. I was passionate about real estate, but I learned so much about this. Can we go to the sine wave? Um, but then uh, my father was a math professor, and I thought about how would I convey the meaning of life to my father. And I would say, life is a sine wave. What is your angle of evolution? A sine wave, you remember the, the old up and down from high school geometry. But the key is, we all have our ups and downs in life, but we're also going on this angle of evolution, where our growth, most people are born at a 15 degree angle upward. Us in this room, we were born in the Bay Area, we're well educated, we're bright people, we learn a lot, we were born at a 30 degree angle. But I'm, I think through all the lessons I've been, I'm now at a 45 degree angle and I'm hoping to go to 60. So the thing is, if you can increase your angle of evolution, by really processing and growing, even when you're in that downturn, you actually might be growing because the angle is so high. So now I can handle all the downturns that I face in my life because this is just, these are lessons, this is growth. What can I learn from this? And that even that moment when I'm in the abyss, when I feel all the pain from that car accident, then I'm like, I'm already up there. I already see what I'm gonna, I'm gonna use this hardship and I'm gonna grow. And by having that sense of perspective, it opens things up and I can handle more than I could have otherwise let me just give you a quick example. In physical therapy, what they'll oftentimes ask you, on a scale of one to 10, 10 being the most intense pain you've ever felt, how does this feel? And I remember I was asked that about 10 days after my accident, where I had all this scar tissue where they took, they opened me up, took skin from here, put it down here, and then my, my leg was, the scar tissue hardened, so I couldn't straighten my leg out. It was like literally crooked. So I had a really strong 200 plus pound physical therapist, and he's like taking me like this, all the scar tissue is like stretching out, and it's like so painful. But, and he's like, on a, but he's like, 10 being the most intense pain you ever felt, how does this feel? And I thought about my 10, the car hitting me, the sky beating me. That was a powerful 10. I'm like, I don't know, this is a three? And then there was an elderly gentleman behind me, and there was, someone's moving his pinky. He's like, this is a nine! This is a nine! <laughs> and, and it probably was his nine. But the key to life, have as many intense experiences as you can. That's your frame of reference. And by having a true 10, having a true knowing pain, Knowing loss through my sister, I can, if I lose an escrow, I'm, I, I thought I was going to make 200K in this escrow, I made nothing, it blew up. Eh, these things happen. I'll make it up next year. Like, it's just, I think part, I'm a better agent 
because I'm calmer. I don't let things bother me as much. And that's the key to life. Take these big chances, but you're just you're fortifying yourself. You're taking vitamins of life and getting stronger and stronger. And each new experience is a building block to rise higher and higher. Um, oh, OK, perfect. So, and there's actually two other tragedies, but I'm going to have to go over one of them pretty quickly. Again, so, so little time. Um, but after the car accidents, um, about 10 years later, life was going so well. Um, but I'm playing with my kids all the time. But I started feeling some lower back pain. I'm like, that's kind of, it's not great. But I'm like, I'm dan I have these two, well, four, two and two, two daughters, but two sons. But I was always picking up my daughters, dancing. I'm like, OK, that's natural back pain. But then the back pain went on for a month. I'm like, OK, let me see a doctor about this. So he said, Ken, you're probably fine. We'll just give you a steroid shot. Plate safe. Let's do a quick MRI but I'll see you in a week for the steroid shot. He calls me the next morning. He's like, Ken, get over here right away. I'm like, ooh, that's not good. So I get over there Saturday morning, I'm in shorts, and, and then I'm like, what's going on? He's like, well, Ken, good news, bad news. The good news is your back and spine, perfectly straight, you're in great shape. I'm like, the bad news? He goes, well, the bad news is you have a tumor the size of a softball that's pushing on your spine and causing the pain. And I was like 34 at the time, I'm like, how, how can this be? And he goes, well, tell me about the scars on your leg. And I told him about my accent. He goes, well, we, don't, we, we think what you have is lymphoma, but we don't know exactly what causes lymphoma. But it happens, strikes when people are young, and it's heavily correlated with trauma. And this is the lymph node that drains your right leg, and all this trauma that you had to your leg increased the likelihood of cancer. So I was just kind of taken aback. Um, I just thought of my two daughters, my unborn son, um, and then He's like, I have an appointment for you in an hour at the Stanford Cancer Center. Um, but I had a little, so I went to the men's restroom. Nobody was there. And they started crying. Um, thought of my family. And then just even money. Like, will my wife have enough money, et cetera, for the kids? Um, but through my tears, about 30 minutes, I realized I'm strong enough for this. That no matter the outcome, life or death, I'm going to make the most of it. Um, and life or death, because how about life? I'm a big believer in that mind-body connection, self-fulfilling prophecy. By being positive and confident, I increase the likelihood of my survival, I felt. But that being said, what if it doesn't work out? A lot of great people succumb to cancer. That being said, all the more reason, if I only had, the doctor said, there's a chance that things don't go well, you have six months left. I'm not going to cry during these six months. Every, every moment matters. Um, so I'm like, so I called my wife up and said, I have cancer, but we're going to be fine. Of course, she started crying. Um, but you know, thanks to Stanford, um, six rounds of chemo, 30 plus days of radiation, totally gone. Um, and then, but just to, for real estate, I was focused on making money just because I wanted to, if I did die, I wanted to have my kids as set up in my life as possible to live in Palo as long as they could. So I was still selling homes. But I would say, whatever you have in your life, just make it work. So I'd go to my listing appointments, I'd carry my IV behind me, <laughs> and then be like, I'm going to beat the flowing market, and I'm going to beat this cancer. Commission? Commission's 10%. This, this is expensive. <laughs> <laughs> but don't worry, you only pay if I survive the close of escrow, so it's fine. <laughs> um, but I actually had, I was early in my career. The year before, I had uh, 28 million in sales. I had a three month period while going through daily radiation and some chemo where I sold over 30 million. And it's just like, I was just focused. And you know what, also, all my, you know, have your, your A level clients, your B level clients, your C level clients? I fired all my C-level clients. I'm like, I finally have an excuse. I got cancer, yo. You can't complain now. You're fired. <laughs> um, but uh, I real, realized how valuable time was. So I fired all my C-level clients. I was totally focused on my top clients. And I'm just like cranking out sales. And that's just a metaphor where now I'm more selective about who my clients are. Because everything, the person, you close one door, you open up two more. You, you, know, you have to always be aware of what's going on. Um, so that one worked out well. But of course, you know, you can't just have three tragedies. Anyone can have three tragedies. Jeez. Um, so let me get to the final one. But you know, I'm still hopeful something could happen. Hopefully, I'll hit, the, hit by a card and make a better speech on the way out of here. <laughs> um, but, uh, but about two years ago, um, I, f I saw a little bump in my neck. I'm like, oh, that's not good. Given that I had a lot of lymph nodes are in the neck. Um, so I had a biopsy. And then they said, Ken, we, we think you have and I'm like, is my lymphoma back? We're like, Ken, well, we think you have lymphoma and thyroid cancer. Um, and I was like, ooh, two cancers. Even, even for me, that might be a little, it's a little tough. But 
This is when I was, I was diagnosed about two years, two, a little over two years ago. This is when I found out. Um, and now here, a veteran of tragedies. Looks like I either another lymphoma um, outbreak or maybe more likely thyroid cancer. There's the bump. They're taking the just like the biopsy now and the results soon. When I found out on Friday that I had suspicious long cell probably cancerous, <clears> then <throat> 30 minutes, I just kind of got myself back up. I'm going to beat this. Even if I don't beat this, I beat my fear of death because I've done everything I want to do. Of course, I'm going to live longer. But if not, I lived that life I wanted. <clears throat> So unfortunately, that cancer was pretty strong. I have about five days left, but I gotta say, I'm so excited to be spending my last five here. <laughs> Just kidding, <laughs> sorry. Um, but actually, that is true. This is how I wanted to go. Um, but yeah, no, thankfully, I um, was able to beat that one as well. But notice just the time to process tragedy. It took me six years to get through my sister and all the loss and the guilt I felt. Um, but then the car accident, within three hours, I'd already processed it. And then my first cancer, within 30 minutes, I processed it. Here, I didn't lose any time. Because part of the reason I'm doing so well in life is I'm just resilient. Because any time you have, any time that's wasted with woe is me, jealousy of others, um, fear, they're all wasted emotions. And I just don't have time to waste. So I just, whatever, whatever my, I thought, what is my life philosophy in just three words? Accept and optimize. It is what it is. I have to accept it. I can't, I didn't want the second cancer. I didn't want anything. But, and then actually, there's arguments that the car, the car crash probably caused the first cancer, and then I had a lot of radiation, which is correlated with thyroid cancer. Um, so there's arguments that the car accident caused both, and I just, wrong place, wrong time. I'm not going to dwell on that. I'm not going to waste time. So I just, that's why I've done so well. I worked, um, I, had a, I had a surgery. Um, I actually had two surgeries for them to remove it. Um, but after the second surgery, I had two blood bags here. But I was also an escrow on a $35 million home with a multi-billionaire. So, what do I, so I just wore a three-piece suit, the vest, and I literally had the blood bags in me. Yeah. No, it's not, it's not sexy. Uh, but it's just like, I'm like, I'm going to power through this. Because it's by working, I think I can just be more focused on that. But also just to be really focused on the positives of it all. And nothing's going to get me down. And it doesn't matter what the world throws at me because I can control it. I can't control the event, but within that, within your mind is the ability to shape that event. And I've turned all, all uh, beyond not being able to bring my sister back, everything else has made my life better, more fulfilled, more enjoyable, more interesting, and I wouldn't have changed a thing. And that's the key to life. You can't control it. You can shape your life. I've shaped mine, but it's all up to you and to that interpretation. And then to conclude to a degree, to why do bad things happen to sexy people? It's, uh, it's really that eternal question. But actually, in hindsight, I think it's reverse. It's the bad things that make us sexy. It's the hardships in life. It's the setbacks. And then that breeds self-confidence, acceptance of self, love of self, giving to others. That's what makes us sexy. The best person you can be is actually to give as much of yourself as you can. I call it enlightened selfishness. And by becoming great, you can give back so much more. And my tragedies have helped shine a spotlight on what's important. And I'm hoping by sharing that now, you kind of realize you're strong enough for anything. There's no setback in this world you can't conquer, can't overcome. But who are you? What's the, why are we here? It's just to live that greatest life, to be your most authentic self. And why are we here? I think it's just to create, to create your world, to create your life and to take things that other people do, but to put your own individual spin on it. Um, <clears throat> just a quick final example, dancing. I think most people view dancing as kind of like this thing, you do it in public, you, you dance for others, um, you're trying to be accepted, and I'm like, no, I'm gonna dance for myself. I usually dance by myself. Um, but it's just, when I dance, it's more about psychological release, 
It's more about physical fitness. It's just about community. Yeah. 